Hi everyone, thank you for being here uh, for the fourth week of our course already. Um, today we are going to talk about a big, big subject. Um, it's a subject that I find so interesting. I know I have said that before in other videos and that I, I keep, I mean, I teach this course for a reason, right? I, I, I enjoy these subjects. So um, anyway, I think that um, today's subject is, is particularly interesting and it is a big, big subject and it is quite complex. Um, it's something that we're going to continue kind of engaging with um, throughout the duration of our course. And uh, it's the subject of biopolitics, but specifically today's class will be focused on the question of biopolitics in relation to settler colonialism. Um, I apologize in advance for the amount of white men in the beginning of this lecture. I promise it will get better uh, more towards the end. Um, but uh, the concept of biopolitics is uh, very much associated or often associated with the work of French philosopher Michel Foucault, right? Although, of course, other analysis um, tangent to what can be described as biopolitics are also present and honestly foundational in the works of many, many anti-colonial scholars like Franz Fanon or Maria Lugones or Ramon Grosfogel, Sylvia, Sylvia Winter, and uh, M. S. Césaire, just to um, name a few. So understanding biopolitics is fundamental to understanding the mechanisms that sustain colonial power, um, as we will see in this lecture. It will help us kind of flesh out some of the discussions that we've been having up until now and to, I think, contextualize them uh, a little bit better. So to start, um, during the 1970s, uh, Foucault conducted an extensive interrogation of power and uh, questions of gov governmentality in a series of lectures uh, at the Collège de France. Um, in these lectures uh, and in this interrogation of power, Foucault traced what he saw as a transition from older articulations of power, or at least older articulations of power in Western societies, um, which he described as sovereign power, to a more contemporary form uh, or manifestation of power, which he calls biopower. So to start from, from the beginning, from the very beginning, um, Foucault identified sovereign power as a type of power exercised through what he calls a deduction. That is, the right to seize assets, goods, products, services, labor, blood. Um, he says, uh, clarifying that, that the sovereign exercised his right of life only by exercising his right to kill or by refraining from killing. He evidenced his power over life only through the death he was capable of requiring. The right, which was formulated as the power of life and death, was in reality the right to take life or let live. So when we think about this formulation, when we think about this particular formation of power that he does, he's describing here, um, this boils down to a right of taking away, a right of seizure, as, as we said, right? Um, that encompassed things, time, bodies, and ultimately, of course, life itself. So a significant uh, example of this power formation and to, to kind of um, uh, buttress his argument, to uh, explain his argument a little better, Foucault um, calls on events like wars. He mentions uh, wars 
as an example of this. So in war, the sovereign exercised his power over life by requiring his subject to take part in this defense of the state, that is, calling uh, his subjects to form, um, to join uh, military enterprises that were meant to defend this state. In a situation like this, the sovereign had, as Foucault remarks, the right to expose his subjects' lives without directly proposing their death. Though death was, of course, implied in a situation like that. Now, it's very interesting that he focuses or he um, remarks on, on, on war in particular, that he looks at war as an emblematic event of that. Because if you think about it, the series of events, um, the series of, of lectures and writings where Foucault was developing this concept of biopower happened in the 1970s, that is during the Cold War. And all of the fears of mass death that, that a, a historical moment like that entailed and again, here, um, just as a, a small aside, it's, I think, very interesting for us to think about how important it is context when we're, we're thinking about the history of, a certain, of uh, certain ideas and um, where knowledge comes from, right? Which is a conversation that we've been having also in the previous lectures, where this knowledge come from. Knowledge always responds to the conditions uh, of the world, right? Um, and uh, Foucault's observations were, of course, fundamentally tied to this context, to the context in which they arose, a context of impending nuclear war. So in this post-war era, the development of, of certain military technologies, and in particular, of course, um, the, the nuclear bomb and its, its um, uh, subsequent developments like the hydrogen bomb and so on. So the development of these military technologies that allowed for mass, uh, of these um, in incredibly powerful military technologies led to unprecedented possibilities for the enactment of, of mass death. All-out, complete, all-encompassing destruction was now very much within reach. It was a menace of every day. In the space of a second, humankind could be wiped out. Few in an event like that could, would survive. And even those who did would have to survive again and again walking an earth poisoned by nuclear radiation. The possibilities were very bleak, if you think about it. So it is within this context, this, um, this context of this generalized anxiety too, that Foucault points out that with the rise of the modern nation state in the 18th century, he focuses again on wars. He says, wars are no longer waged in the name of a sovereign who must be defended, which is uh, a stark contrast to the situation that he described um, in his analysis of sovereign power, right? Uh, he continues, um, these wars are waged on behalf of the existence of everyone. Entire populations are mobilized for the purpose of wholesale slaughter in the, lame, in the name of life necessity. Massacres have become vital. It is as managers of life and survival, of bodies and then race, that so many regimes have been able to wage so many wars, causing so many men to be killed. So this new framing changes everything then. Because here, Foucault, the way that he's framed it, the key to power then is not the right to subtract and to deduct and to seize anymore, right? Instead, this new power formation that um, 
that he's discussing, that he's describing here, is centered around the right to, as he says, to foster life or disallow it to the point of death. So Foucault, kind of developing that a little bit more, um, he goes on to say that if genocide is indeed the dream of modern powers, this is not because of a recent return of the ancient right to kill. It is because power is situated and exercised at the level of life, the species, the race, and the large-scale phenomena of population, which is, of course, um, uh, particularly relevant to us in this course and a question that we will continue, as I said, to engage with uh, for the rest of, of the semester. So the question here is that biopower handles the biological mechanism of life um, as an issue that is at once that is both scientific and political, as a biological problem and as a problem of power. And it is precisely then um, this moment of transition to biopolitical forms of governance in the 18th century that he describes as the threshold of modernity for a given society. So this is what he describes as biopower then, the mechanisms through which biological characteristics of humans become objects of, and this is a quote, a political strategy of a general strategy of power, or in other words, how starting from the 18th century, modern Western societies took on board the fundamental biological fact that human beings are a species. So here from this description, we can take a couple of things, right? Uh, first, that biopower concerns itself with questions of population. And that biopower also concerns itself with questions related to the individual. We have then two aspects of power that need to be managed at the same time. They need to be managed concurrently. Identifying biopower as a technology that kind of straddles both societal, like broader societal spheres, and also more intimate and more individual uh, spheres. So uh, clarifying these two aspects or these two facets, let's say, of biopower, Foucault continues by remarking how on the individual scale, Biopower articulates the body as a machine and how biopower acts on, on the body or on this body machine on its disciplining, the optimization of its capabilities, the extortion of its forces, the parallel increase of its usefulness and docility and its integration into systems of efficient and economic controls. And this, sorry, this was um, a quote, by the way. So on the second facet, or the second pole, as he calls it, biopower then, and this is, we, talk, we were talking now just about the, the individual or the um, smaller scale aspects of, aspect of biopower. But um, then uh, Foucault goes on to, uh, to discuss biopower widening its lenses and uh, focusing on the question of the body of the species and not the body of the individual. The body of the species as in, or that is, on the population. So in order to... Um, to focus on, uh, on this collective body, on the body of the species, biopower then needs to intervene on a number of biological processes that are ultimately also political processes, processes of um, propagation and migration, processes or rates of birth and mortality, and the processes 
associated with those events or for instance also the level of health in a given group or a given society or community um, or life expectancy and, and uh, longevity which are of course also focused on uh, levels of health I mean all of these things are interconnected right and also uh, I think it's very very important to remark not only um, birth and mortality health but also the production and circulation of wealth is also a fundamental uh, aspect of life in which biopower intervenes because it is also fundamentally tied to all those other aspects of um, of uh, of the life of a community of a, or a population. So now here we have, I would say, a rough, very rough outline of what Foucault meant by, by, by biopower, right? So we need to kind of transition to the concept of biopolitics. And I, I, here I want to make um, a differentiation, even though uh, as scholar Thomas Lemke uh, discusses, Foucault didn't completely distinguish the two, actually, in his lectures. Sometimes he used them interchangeably, and I just want to clarify that for you um, so there's no, uh, there's no confusion. Um, just so we understand that this is a question in Foucault's work itself. Um, so Lemke uh, writes that regardless of these inconsistencies and regardless of the fact that Foucault um, often used these words or these concepts kind of interchangeably sometimes, um, it is possible still to identify three ways in which he approaches biopolitics. So Lemke, uh, in Lemke's reading, these would be um, biopolitics as a historical rupture in political thinking and practice that is characterized by a rearticulation of sovereign power. Biopolitics as the foundation of modern racism and biopolitics as a distinctive art of government that historically emerges with liberal forms of social regulation and individual self-governance. Now, I think uh, maybe it's interesting now to, uh, to focus on certain aspects of these three. Um, biopolitics as rupture, biopolitics as foundation of racism, and biopolitics as art of government. What this tells me is that biopolitics then it is is the, or as I understand it at least, is the enactment of biopower. Now, let's, um, I think this is perhaps a, a, quick, uh, a quick overview of uh, biopolitics through Foucauldian lenses or uh, through, uh, through the, the um, outline that Foucault offers us. But of course, um, as I said, this is quite a, a complex subject. And um, as such, um, there have been quite a few people that have stirred that pot since Foucault first offered this conceptualization um, or was recognized as offering this conceptualization as we will also see during our class and later on this week. So um, to continue this overview, building on this Foucaultian uh, formulation of biopower, Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben in the 90s started looking into the regime established by the Holocaust to develop, to develop um, his own kind of framing of biopolitics in the book Homo Sacer. Now, Agamben 
disagrees with Foucault somewhat here because he understands that the articulation of sovereign power inherently demands that a biopolitical body also come into being. He doesn't see the rupture. He doesn't see the, 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 um, the discontinuation that Foucault sees. Um, what Agamben remarks is that the inclusion of some in, in a regime like that implies already the exclusion of others. So he understands this emergence of biopower, as I said, not as a break from a Western tradition, as Foucault does, but as, honestly, a logical continuation of a political tradition that he traces back into ancient Greece. According to Agamben, actually, the most fundamental organization of politics doesn't stand really in the oppositional binary of ally and enemy, but rather in the notion of what he calls bare life. A life or, or that which is situated in the liminal state between life and death. The zone of exception between zoe, uh, which is the Greek word for natural life, and bios, political life. So in Agamben's theorization, this distinction defines the contours of what is one's natural being and what is legal existence. So from the moment this differentiation comes into being, we have here a zone of exclusion, a state of exception, where law does not apply in quite the same way. So Agamben, in order to uh, support his argument and give us kind of a, a more fleshed out example of what he means, he looks um, or he references the figure of the homo satyr, someone who in ancient Rome or in ancient Roman law had been banned or removed from society's political and legal spaces and could therefore be killed with no legal consequences, be killed with impunity. And this is, of course, where the example of the Nazi regime comes, uh, comes in very handy to Agamben in his argument, right? Um, those imprisoned, exploited, and killed in concentration camps were, after all, people deprived of legal and social rights. Those existing at the margins of a society that did not recognize them legally as human beings. Agamben mentions, and this, mind you, in the 90s, refugees and asylum seekers as examples of people existing in these conditions of bare life. And I would argue that what we are seeing right now, um, and I would argue several, of course, several scholars have um, already also commented on that, but that what we are seeing right now in terms of... Um, of camps in the United States or also within the confines of Europe, what we're seeing there is also, uh, can also be framed as an expression of, of um, this notion of bare life. So, especially thinking about camps, about um, the, the conditions in which so many people are being held by uh, European nation states, by the United States, um, by Australia, to name a few very well-known examples. It's very interesting to think that the people who are right now in this very moment being held in these conditions are people that most often have come from what is known as the global south. Uh, people who live in what Maria Lugones calls the dark side of the colonial modern gender system. 
So these arguments presented by Foucault and Agamben and the analysis of the coloniality of power offered by, by Grosfogel and Lugones, amongst others, of course, differ, however, in a fundamental point, right? Um, Foucault and Agamben locate the emergence of biopolitics in their life within the confines of modern Europe. And in contrast, the colonial regimes of hierarchization, management, and regulation of bodies identified by Grosfogel and, and Lugones, again, just to name a few, um, have their origin much, much earlier, that is, in the European project of colonial domination. The creation of racial hierarchies, which is, after all, an endeavor that justified and propelled the colonial enterprise, as Anibal Quijano uh, discusses. Uh, so this creation of racial hierarchies constituted an early and fundamental exercise of biopower. It is, after all, through the exploitation of colonies that the modern European nation states, where Foucault uh, locates the birth of biopolitics, can even come into being. So I want to ask, how can this form of power even be sustained if not through the positioning of certain individuals and certain populations in a condition of absolute subjugation? This is a process that is buttressed by the establishment of the modern colonial gender system, where populations and individuals existing in this dark side were used and regulated, and where their birth and mortality rates became fundamental matters for the production of wealth for the metropolis. It is a process that, in order to be established and continued, demanded to be justified discursively and epistemologically through the creation of racial hierarchies. The racial hierarchies that we have discussed last week created this uh, discursive and epistemological creation also entailed the, the domination of knowledge, the, the, um, the establishment of, um, of uh, a biological justification for racial superiority of white Europeans over all others. So it is a process that framed biological different that was framed as biological difference and but that was ultimately produced through and for the biopolitics of settler colonialism now it's useful to also uh think of this from another perspective because as i said until now the conversation uh, seems to be incredibly white and unidimensional. And, I mean, I love Foucault. I appreciate the work of Agamben, even though he's been saying uh, some very silly things about the current corona situation. But um, I think from the moment that we also look into all of these uh, questions from the perspective, from uh, an anti-colonial perspective, from a perspective that takes into account race and settler colonial formations, we gain a, such a, a deeper uh, understanding of, of the concept of biopolitics or, um, yeah, anyway. Um, so in here, uh, when we expand this conversation, um, and when we, we develop this conversation further, it's useful to take in Akil Mbembe, um, an amazing scholar who right now is very, very unfortunately dealing with a number of baseless attacks from white German scholars who apparently cannot contain their racism. Uh, 
anyway, you can look that up if you if you want to. So um, thinking about the articulation of colonial power and the establishment of the transatlantic slave trade, um, Mbembe points out that the notion of biopower in itself cannot fully account for how the contemporary democratic notion of the nation state is ultimately a project built on the continued production of death for racialized subjects. As we have discussed previously in, in this course, um, and to me this is very interesting to bring up, the Industrial Revolution with all of, the, uh, all of its technological uh, innovations um, cannot be divorced really uh, from the establishment of, of colonies and the exploitation of entire peoples, right? Uh, I think this takes us a little bit back to that conversation that we had uh, referencing the work of archaeologist um, Gonzalez Ribal, who remarked that Staffordshire, China, exists in the same, in the very same world as the slave quarters, and that one cannot be disentangled from the other. Coloniality is ultimately a cannibalistic process. It is through, through the consumption of some bodies, consumption that goes until death, that others become able to accumulate wealth. It is through this cannibalistic process, though Membe doesn't really describe it as uh, cannibalistic, uh, this is a term that I'm using, um, but it is through this cannibalistic process that Western capitalism comes into being. And this is where Mbembe offers then um, instead or as um, a further development uh, of thinking on biopolitics, he offers the concept of necropolitics. So um, thinking about this question of the colony uh, uh, Mbembe, specifically, he, he starts thinking about the colony um, as a state of exception, as the locus of the state of, exp uh, of ex exception. So he says that if the relations between life and death, the politics of cruelty and the symbolic of profanity are blurred in the plantation system, it is notably in the colony and under the apartheid regime that comes into being a peculiar terror formation. The most original feature of this terror formation is its concatenation of biopower, the state of exception, and the state of siege. Crucial to this concatenation is once again race. In fact, in most instances, the selection of races, the prohibition of mixed marriages, forced sterilization, and even the, the extermination of, of vanquished peoples are to find their first testing ground in the colonial world. So to uh, Continuing this uh, conversation and this contextualization then of biopolitics um, in, uh, in, the, uh, in relation to uh, coloniality, scholar Alexander Wehelie in his excellent, excellent book, Habeas Viscus, I highly recommend that you, you read it. If you can get a hold of it, I can put a PDF on or our Google Drive, if you want. Um, it is a very complex book, though. It took me quite a long time to get through it. So don't be too, um, too anxious. Give it time. Give it the time that it needs if you decide to read this book. But anyway, plug over. Um, 
so scholar Alexander Wehelie, um in this in this book, which offers a brilliant, brilliant analysis of biopolitics um, in relation to black feminist thought and uh, racializing assemblages, Wehelia contends that racial slavery represents the biopolitical nomos, that is a Greek word meaning law or custom, of modernity. So racial slavery represents the biopolitical nomos of modernity, particularly given its historically, historically antecedent status vis-a-vis -vis the Holocaust and the many different ways it highlights the continuous and non-exceptional modes of physiological and psychic violence exerted upon black subjects since the dawn of modernity. Now, in relation to this question of the Holocaust, scholar Tony Fry points out that the Holocaust actually, in, in its attempt to regulate patterns of life and death, was in a way, or could, can be understood as a command system of compliance, which is inscribed in the altogether instrumentalized system of the operation of working life. And this was um, a quote, by the way, too. Um, this instrumentalization was realized, according to Fry, um, across three different dimensions. So it was realized as a, and quote, a designed organizational and management system, as a design system of mass production, of death supported by specifically designed technologies and as a designed architectural project. So the, the design of strategies and technologies that enforced compliance was then crucial, right, to the Holocaust's project of, of regulation of life and death because in a way it removed the decision, and this is again a quote, the decision of killing, uh, the decision to kill from the action of killing, with this act simply conducted by the compliance of actors who were already ontologically designed to comply. So it's interesting, Fry locates um, this analysis, um, this his analysis of this intersection of, of biopolitics and technology within the confines of Europe, again, right? We're talking about the design of, and Fry uh, specifically talks about the design of architectural structures such as the, con the concentration camp um, and so on. But um, of course, Fry, um, he also cites the genocides in the Congo, in Rwanda, Darfur, Kosovo, Chechnya, Cambodia, and Srebrenica, to argue that um, whereas the Holocaust was not um, an abnormal or an uh, aberrant event, it still remained, he says, a certain benchmark of inhumanity, exposing the thinness of the line between being civilized and being dehumanized and dehumanizing in the very heartland of Western civilization. In bringing design to the core, the essence of the Holocaust, the objective is to add a new frame of observation on both what was a designing event and design historically placed. I would argue, however, that um, I find that analysis very interesting, particularly um, coming from a, a design background. I find it very interesting that he, that he talks about the design of compliance in that sense, the creation of systems that are made for, uh, for obedience, for, um, for um, 
yeah, for, for, I mean, for compliance, for obedience, for, um, actors, uh, involved in it, kind of removing themselves from the, the horror in which they were participating. But at the same time, I would argue that positing the Holocaust, um, as Foucault, Agamben, or Arendt, uh, also Hannah Arendt, have done before him as the fundamental event where a process of dehumanization becomes evident, Fry, in a way, ends up organizing his analysis again around an understanding of whiteness as the phenomenon which, when threatened, the ontological phenomenon that, when threatened, allows us to, to actually evince, to see the materialization of biopolitics. And my problem with this is that in, in doing that, he, he fails to acknowledge the events that preceded and created the conditions for the Holocaust itself. Um, most importantly, the reconfiguration of subjectivity identified by anti-colonial thinkers, and which is fundamental to the project of coloniality, as we have seen. And here, um, when I talk about this, I'm referencing, uh, again, the works of um, Franz Fanon, of Maria Lugones, or of Anibal Quijano, uh, Ramon Grossoyel, Sylvia Winter, and so on and so forth. Um, so although Fry admits that the Holocaust was not an abnormal and aberrant event, he posits its deployment of, of biopolitics, or, or biopower perhaps, um, more clearly, as a uniquely European phenomenon. And framing this analysis within um, this exclusively Western European context, um, it erases or it obscures how the materialization of biopolitics is a project that is carried out first and foremost to enforce the racial and sexual hierarchies upon which the project of coloniality was built. So going back and thinking again um, uh, about Alexander Wehelie and his contextualization of biopolitics in relation to the processes, uh, to processes of racialization, right? Let's go a little bit back to that. Um, so Wehelie, in his analysis, he goes back to what he calls or to look into what he calls the colonial prehistory of concentration camps. <coughs> and uh, in doing so, he traces the conditions, <coughs> sorry, been talking too much. Um, so Wehelie, um, in doing that, he traces the conditions that enabled the occurrence of the Holocaust. And he particularly, um, one example that he gives that I find very, very relevant, uh, particularly because we are, after all, um, in Germany, or teaching this class um, through a German institution, he goes back to the genocide of the Herero and Nama peoples carried out by the German Empire in what is known as modern-day Namibia and at the time was known as German Southwest Africa. Um, this genocide, if you have not heard about it, happened in the first decade of the 20th century. Um, Germany to this day has not um, offered uh, nearly the same level of contrition and recognition um, that um, the Holocaust that happened within the confines of Europe um, has. And uh, that's a whole other issue. But anyway, um, historian Benjamin Madley uh, points out that 
um, even the term Concentrationslager, uh, even this term that has become so, so associated with the Nazi regime, um, neither, I mean, neither the term Concentrationslager nor the, the institution or, or the, the space itself were, were first coined by the Nazi regimes by the Nazi regime. Um, both the, uh, the idea of the Concentrationslager, of the concentration camp, preceded, actually, the Nazi regime. The first concentration camps were built in this African colony during the rule of Kaiser Wilhelm II, uh, which uh, is to be honest, um, is something that was likely influenced by the British, who had made use of similar enclosed spaces in the South African War and in Cuba previously. So under the command of German general Lotta von Trotta, uh, however, these spaces, these um, concentration camps, were then divided um, in this uh, genocide of uh, the Herero and Nama peoples. Um, these concentration camps were um, divided into two categories. Camps geared simply to kill and camps where prisoners were worked under conditions that routinely led to death. Any references there, right? So starting from, um, from these historical considerations on, on the role of these death camps um, in the conflict between um, the colonial invaders, the Germans, and the, the Nama and Herero peoples, Wehelie observes that the European camps, and by extension the Holocaust, cannot be projected um, onto what he describes as an exceptional ontological screen. So in other words, um, they are not abnormalities, which is something that uh, Fry also admits, let's be honest. Um, so these, uh, these camps are not anomalous endpoints. They're not, um, and they're not uh, unusual or, or aberrant origins. Whether the occurrence of these events needs to be examined in, and this is a quote, in its constitutive relationality in the modern world, as well as the resultant displacement of racial slavery, colonialism, and indigenous genocide as nomos, again, um, the word for law or custom, of modern politics. So to, to repeat that a little bit. So these events need to be examined in their constitutive relationality in the modern world, as well as the resultant displacement of racial slavery, colonialism, and indigenous genocide as the law of modern politics. So to go back a little bit, it's interesting to think that, um, again, in Fry's terms or um, in even Agamben or, uh, or Foucault's terms, biopolitics becomes materialized only from the moment when it takes place in Europe. The events that precede the emergence and structuring of biopolitical regimes in Europe are then obscured, right, again. So, of, of course, uh, Fry is not alone in overlooking these manifestations of, of biopower outside of Europe. Um, Weheli himself points out to uh, similar gaps left, as I said, by Foucault and Agamben in their theorizations, writing that although racism constitutes the very foundation of the Foucaultian concept of biopolitics, it only attains, and this is a quote, it only attains relevance once it penetrates the borders of fortress Europe. So looking beyond 
the borders of fortress Europe is, as Weheli argues, fundamental for a more comprehensive grasp of the dynamics of biopolitics. And honestly, I would add, for a more comprehensive understanding of how biopolitics become materialized. And again, um, shifting our gaze towards the present, and again, I find this a very, very interesting example. Fry highlights um, what he calls like these systems of compliance, because um, I'm also bringing this always back to systems of compliance and technologies, which are um, things that we will continue to discuss uh, further in this course. But um, Fry highlights that systems of compliance characteristic of biopolitical regimes now, uh, this is a quote, arrive by a quieter, but nonetheless equally powerful means. Education in the service of the economic status quo. Um, he uh, cites as an example of this, the representation of humans as target dots on the screens of drone operator systems, which is after all a strategy to enforce again, a division between decision and compliance by obscuring the target subjectivity. That is not a dot, that is a person. But by becoming a dot on that screen, and again, we're talking about technologies of warfare, once again. And technologies of warfare, by the way, um, associated with uh, very contemporary forms of warfare. And when I talk about drones, um, what are we imagining? We're imagining warfare in the Middle East, which is something that has defined uh, the, the beginning of this century uh, since 9-11, right? So um, anyway, um, in, uh, in representing uh, these human beings as target dots uh, in, in the screens of drone operator systems, um, this biopolitics is, is materialized as um, this strategy to, to enforce a division between decision and compliance. So Fry, um, Fry never directly engages with the relation um, between the enactment of what is um, ostensibly a deployment of power to dictate those who may die and the imperialist project of domination undertaken by the United States, although the objects that he analyzes, as I said, um, the drone, the interface through which the drone is controlled, are inextricably linked to, to how this project has, um, as I said, shaped warfare in the Middle East in the past decades. And... Uh, Whilst one could argue that there is um, a strong impulse to, a strong um, economic impulse, of course, to said warfare, particularly when the region in question holds uh, strategic economic resources, the same could be said about the project of colonial domination undertaken by European nations in, in centuries past. Gold, oil, diamonds, coffee, tea, cocoa, tomatoes, potatoes. The struggle for these resources is informed crucially, most crucially, by the notion that some bodies have more right to life than others. Now, we're now at 54 exactly 54 minutes in this theory part of the lecture. I kind of wanted to already start discussing um, some of the artworks that I uh, that I suggested you take a look and that I put uh, on our Google Drive for this week. And particularly, um, I wanted to look into those, uh, those artworks in relation to the text that I asked you to read this one by Scott Morganson. Um, I know I haven't talked specifically about this text 
Um, but I wanted, I, uh, I think that uh, Morganson makes very, very interesting connections between um, Foucault and Agamben and Mbembe um, and, uh, and settler colonialism. But I wanted to give you, at least in this theory part, um, a more stable ground from which to, to start these conversations. Uh, because I think maybe um, Morganson, Morganson's paper uh, is probably a little bit easier to read if you are already familiar with the concept of biopolitics. So I wanted to give you a, a, a base from which to start a discussion. Um, so I think I will leave the discussion specifically of the Eckhout series that, of artworks, of paintings, um, to, to our uh, live discussion or live class. Um, there are many, many interesting points that I want to raise for us in this, in this uh, conversation. But I think for now, this should be it. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, again, I find this an incredibly fascinating framing and an incredibly um, important, honestly, um, theoretical tool uh, with which to to engage with um, the world, uh, with which to analyze the world. And um, I'm very much looking forward to our conversation. Thank you. <laughs>